I appreciate the comments made by the Senator from Connecticut, and I come to the floor to talk about a very important issue, U.S. manufacturing jobs and what the United States Senate needs to do to make sure that we're protecting U.S. manufacturing jobs. I'm speaking of the need to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank, a credit agency that helps U.S. manufacturers and small businesses sell their products to overseas markets. Some of you may have read recently uh, comments by some of our colleagues uh, where they have shifted their position and the agency is set to expire on September 30th of this year. And it's so critical that we reauthorize this program because it's such an important tool for U.S. manufacturers. Over the last few weeks, uh, fringe organizations and activists have suddenly tried to turn this into a uh, political casualty, saying that we should kill the program. And I'm here to advocate that it is a win-win situation for American manufacturers, for American taxpayers, and for the jobs that it creates. And that's because the Export-Import Bank supports about 1.2 million jobs, and it has returned $1 billion to the U.S. Treasury last year alone, and it supports between 30,000 and uh, 35,000 suppliers of manufactured parts, and that was just in the year 2011. So as this chart shows, the Export-Import Bank helps us generate export sales and supports 1.2 billion jobs. That's between 2009 and 2013. You would think a program that doesn't cost the taxpayers any money actually helps us pay down the deficit and helps create that many export sales and that many jobs would be something that we would want to reauthorize and give predictability to businesses all across the United States. In fact, if the uh, credit agency is not reauthorized, nearly 90% of the companies that would be harmed are small businesses. So sure, there are big companies like Boeing or General Electric or Caterpillar that help uh, sell products around the globe. And some of my colleagues uh, want to criticize that somehow we should be apologizing for the fact that we actually make expensive products and sell them. Uh, I'm quite proud that we sell uh, products to China and various parts of the United, uh, all around the globe from the United States that are actually expensive products. We should be proud that we're making something worth millions of dollars that people want to buy. So I'm glad that Made in the USA is actually closing deals all across the globe. So today, but we also want to highlight that all of these companies who are in the manufacturing uh, sector are part of a manufacturing chain. We know this well because in the state of Washington, when you look at who makes aerospace products, while you can say that there's a company in Everett, Washington named Boeing, there are hundreds of uh, companies, thousands of companies across the United States that are part of what is called the supply chain. Behind every 777 or Caterpillar tractor, there are thousands of workers who are working every day to refine their product, stay competitive, retrain and refocus to make sure that we build the very best products in the United States and that we're competing on a global basis. When these larger companies and small businesses that they work with try to win deals overseas, they run into lots of different challenges. And that's why we're here today to say making sure that we uh, reauthorize this program is critically important to small business manufacturers and suppliers throughout the United States. This export supply chain, so all of these small businesses and companies, 30 to 35,000 companies across the United States, there's actually a supplier in every state in the United States. But let's look at some of the numbers. Uh, in Georgia, there are over 833 different companies, such as United Seal or uh, United Seal and Rubber and other uh, important companies that make products just for aviation or for Caterpillar or for other individuals. In the state of Florida, there's over 1,252 different small businesses and manufacturers that are helping to produce products that are sold on an international basis. And those companies want the Export-Import Bank reauthorized. In the state of Wisconsin, there's over 1,397 different suppliers, such as Hensing Coatings in Milwaukee, which provides 
primer, sealer, and wing coating. And these are companies that also want to see the reauthorization of this important tool that helps products that they help manufacture and build be sold in international markets. And of course, there's places like Texas, which have a lot of people in the supply chain. Here's just some of the companies that are involved in manufacturing that take advantage of this important export credit agency by building product into final assembly and uh, are all over the state of Texas. In fact, here's another uh, continued list of these uh, companies from Texas that are part of building product that are then using the Export-Import Bank to sell their products around the globe. But I can't go over all of those in Texas because there are actually 4,355 different companies in the state of Texas that are involved in the supply chain of companies that are selling products uh, through the Export Credit Agency and its assistance. So you can see that this is not a program that just affects one state or one region. It's an example of small business manufacturers working everywhere to stay competitive, to sell products, and win in the international marketplace. So personally, having visited many of these companies in the state of Washington, I find it very frustrating as these people are working night and day to make the best airplanes, to make the best manufactured product, to take the risk to go and sell in overseas markets, to compete with international competitors, to retrain and reskill a workforce. We have people here in the United States Congress who don't have the good common sense to understand what an important tool the Export-Import Bank is in helping U.S. manufacturers sell into new emerging markets. Now, I know there are other states, we're not going to throw charts about them, but in Ohio, I know the presiding officer is from Ohio, there are over 1,700 suppliers in Ohio, and these companies are companies like Heart Cell Propellers. They're a family-owned propeller manufacturer in um, southwest Ohio, and Heart Cell is part of the Dayton aviation economy that dates back to the Wright brothers. In fact, it was Orville Wright who suggested that the Hartzell family build an airplane propeller back in, the 19, in 1917. So today the Wright brothers are gone, but this company is still here, and they are still innovating. In fact, I think they are part of the spirit of innovation in America that makes America so great. And I am so frustrated that those people here who don't understand that innovation spirit, don't understand what it takes, don't understand that you are hampering, really, right now, almost torturing small businesses by not giving them the certainty and predictability for the export assistance program. These, this company builds a, 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 a crop dusting plane propellers, and Hartzell has grown its company from about 13 percent to about 300 people in the last three years. And that's because these crop dusting planes have been sold using the Export-Import Bank, and the loans haven't come directly to Hartzell, they're part of the XM supply chain, but companies like them who make these propellers are important companies to making sure that we win in the international marketplace. Well, the president of this company, uh, Joe Hartzell, I thought said it best. He said, quote, if you take away the XM Bank from customers, you might as well bring unemployment checks to the offices because you're putting people out on the street. If they're not building as many airplanes, then I'm going to uh, have a problem with those jobs. So here is a manufacturer who, I, uh, I heard the same thing in uh, Seattle a few weeks ago when I was there, but here's an Ohio company who's saying, if you don't get this program reauthorized, we're gonna have bigger problems. So. People like Hartzell are trying to tell everyone here that we need to keep working to make sure that we get this reauthorized. We need to make sure that companies through, throughout the Midwest, like in Wichita, Kansas, or people in the West, like Tempe, Arizona, or companies in Irving, Texas, everywhere where we're part of this in mass, uh, huge supply chain, are doing the work that they need to do. Well, another area that is big on the supply chain uh, is um, 
in the, in the general area of aviation, and it supports over 200,000 jobs. So 200,000 jobs are the number of people who are involved in, in aviation today, and those are individuals, businesses, who are uh, doing their best to stay competitive in aviation, even though we have incredible competition. That incredible competition comes from the fact that there are so many different um, companies around the globe who also want to build airplanes. There's something like a demand for 35,000 new airplanes over the next 20 years. So you can imagine every country wants to try to build airplanes. China wants to build airplanes. Brazil is already in the business, Canada, uh, the Europeans. So everybody wants to build airplanes. Well, the good news for us is we actually have a supply chain in the United States. And this chart represents that supply chain of 15,000 manufacturers and over 1.5 million jobs. So these are all the companies throughout the United States of America who are involved in using the Export-Import Bank to make sure that their products are sold on an international basis. There is actually jobs in a company in every state in the union that takes advantage of being part of this supply chain. And why it's so important to keep the supply chain is because if you keep the supply chain in your country, then you have the skill set that it takes to keep innovating because each of these companies is working on the individual parts and making them the best parts they can possibly be. That way, you get the efficient airplane of today. And so this innovation is taking place all across the country, and we have to stay competitive. Now, get rid of the Export-Import Bank, and over time, this supply chain will start to disappear. Why? Because in Europe, they will still have an Export-Import Bank, and people like Airbus will continue to use that product, and they'll have a supply chain. And over time, all these small businesses and all this expertise in aviation will move out of the United States of America and move somewhere else. So then what manufacturing jobs will we have in the United States? Aviation is one of the best sectors for manufacturing that we have today. With all these employees, over 1.5 million, we need to keep aviation manufacturing competitive in the United States of America, and that's why we need to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. So, there are other sectors uh, of aviation, like Gulfstream, which is a, uh, another company that has, uh, based in uh, Savannah, Georgia, been one of the foremost makers of business jets, and they've watched their international competition increase steadily over the last decade. And Export Import Bank has helped them uh, be competitive. The Gulfstream supply chain, it has about 3,500 different businesses and about 13,000 employees. And all those employees are working hard to try to stay competitive. And they are working to make sure that we keep those jobs in the United States of America. But they also have to have the competition of making sure we have the Export-Import Bank so that they can continue to win in the international, market split, in the international marketplace. So uh, Gulfstream actually sells product to China. So jobs in Georgia uh, and throughout the supply chain are helping us win in the international marketplace, whether they're composite companies or light industrial or fuselage skins. All of these things are helping people be competitive. So right now, uh, Gulfstream in the supply chain sold 8,000 planes to China. That helps support 2,100 jobs. And most of those jobs were right in the Savannah area. So now if we're going to cancel the Export-Import Bank, how are they going to get these products financed and how are they going to get them sold? So while we're very uh, appreciative of both these sectors of aviation, the commercial sector and general aviation sector, uh, we haven't even talked about uh, you know, the other like defense sectors of aviation. These are two big components to our economy. And while some people like to think, oh, well, you know, there's a, there's a way to, uh, you know, get these planes sold, or these are big companies, these are integral parts to our U.S. manufacturing base, and we need to keep it. So the United States 
demand, as I said earlier, is for 35,000 new planes over the next 20 years. And 80% of those planes will be delivered outside of the United States. So that means if we want to keep winning the race for airplane sales, we're going to have to work outside the United States. And yesterday, Standard & Poor's reported that if the Export-Import Bank is not reauthorized, it would be a huge benefit to Airbus. In fact, they said, quote, Airbus would still be able to offer financing, and this could be a deciding factor for some new aircraft contracts, especially in emerging markets, for sales and to start up for a financially weak airlines. So in other words, we'd be handing U.S. jobs overseas, and that is not what we want to do. Countries are building up their investment to try to compete with us, and the Export-Import Bank is a key tool for U.S. Manu manufacturers to compete. So trade is a critically important part of our economy. In 2013, U.S. exports reached $2.3 trillion worth of goods, and a key part of that export growth can be attributed to this program. The Export-Import Bank supported $37.4 billion worth of U.S. exports, which supported over 200,000 jobs in the United States. That alone is enough information for me to say that the Senate ought to act quickly to reauthorize this program. There are many other, other aspects of the Export-Import Bank that helps small businesses and manufacturing. In fact, the manufacturing jobs uh, in the United States are about 12 million jobs, and one in four jobs are tried to exports. And that's why when I think my colleagues try to uh, portray the Export-Import Bank as some issue that maybe a few big companies uh, uh, would benefit from, I think they have it totally wrong. This is an issue about the competitive nature of manufacturing and the supply chain of manufacturers all across the United States and whether we want to keep manufacturing jobs because they are high-wage, high-skilled jobs in the United States of America. And while uh, my colleagues would like to talk about other things in the economy, I think it's important to realize how much manufacturing jobs really are a high wage. They're higher wage than service sector jobs. They help us stabilize the middle class and they help the U.S. economy grow in a way, as I mentioned, because of those large export numbers. And they help the U.S. continue to innovate and stay ahead in a global marketplace. So all of these things are reasons why the Export-Import Bank is such a viable tool. If you think about it from this perspective of being a critical part of manufacturing, and these are the high-wage jobs, and it supports that supply chain that I just went through showing, then you can see why it's so important that this get done before the end of September. Right now what's happening is my colleagues not only want to uh, threaten not to reauthorize this program, they actually want to kill it. I mean, my guess is they would like to say, okay, we'll agree to a short-term extension of a few months only in hopes of killing it later. And I want to make sure that all my colleagues know how important it is that not only that we reauthorize this, that we will reauthorize it for several years so that companies have the predictability and certainty to know that the program is going to be there and they have the support. Now, the Export-Import Bank has four primary tools. It has loan guarantees that provide security to commercial lenders who make loans to foreign buyers of American products. For example, uh, Goss International in New Hampshire, uh, the loan helped them sell their printing presses in emerging markets in Brazil. We have an export credit insurance, and companies like Manhasset in my state of Yakima, Washington, used it to help get their music stands sold across the globe and made sure that there was credit insurance to protect them. There are loan uh, programs, for example, to help uh, foreign buyers of U.S. products like Firm Green in Newport Beach, California, which was run by a disabled veteran who helped to sell their goods in Brazil. And it also provides working capital, like in Morrison Technology Manufacturing in South Carolina, who used the tool to purchase materials needed for recent surge in business that couldn't been met without that financing. 
So here they are, all these companies throughout the country using the Export-Import Bank and staying competitive. Well, I personally would make the Export-Import Bank bigger. When you look at what China's doing or when you look at what Europe's doing, they're making a bigger financial investment in helping their businesses become exporters. We in the United States, the Export-Import Bank finances less than 5% of U.S. exports. So a significant portion of the capital intensive exports are really done in the private sector. But this tool helps commercial banks and helps commercial manufacturers get their product when other avenues aren't available in the private sector. So here's an example of one of the programs of how the Export Import Bank works. You can see that the U.S. exporter sells to the foreign buyer and that commercial financing is still part of the equation. The Export-Import Bank is only used as a safety net to make sure that that financial commercial obligation is secure in this situation. So it's not as if we are replacing commercial banking. It's not as if we aren't making even market rates. We are for uh, products like aerospace. So the issue is if we need to make sure commercial banks are willing to guarantee these kinds of sales, we're providing a safety net with the Export-Import Bank. And what has the cost been to the U.S. government? Well, we've had incredible success because everybody pays fees into this system. And those fees and the success of the program has helped us pay down the federal deficit. That's right. It has actually made money for U.S. taxpayers and helped us pay down the federal deficit. So it supports um, 1.2 million export-related jobs. It has helped support $37 billion in exports from the United States, which helps our economy, and it has returned more than $1 billion to U.S. taxpayers. So I would call that a win-win situation for American jobs and American taxpayers. But we have 73 days left until that program expires. I don't want to let that happen. So today we are announcing that over 200 different supply chain companies are sending a letter to the United States Senate and House of Representatives asking them to urgently support the reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. We're also hearing from lots of businesses and business organizations who also support the immediate reauthorization, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Business Roundtable, National Association of Businesses, the International Association of Machinists, National Grain and Feed Association, and many, many or more organizations. All of these companies want to be able to say, made in the USA, and have their products sold overseas. So I hope my colleagues will be there to help ensure that this program gets reauthorized in a short amount of time. I personally hope the United States Senate will take this legislation up in the next few weeks before we adjourn for the August recess. I would hate to see what happens to all the business deals that these manufacturers have on the table. If they go home in August and people are saying, well, the bank only has a few days left to be reauthorized, I'm not going to do business with you until I know. Or if somebody tries to stick a five-month reauthorization on, you know, on some bill, and then everybody still says, when is this program going to be reauthorized? Otherwise, I'm not going to do a bill. I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do a deal with U.S. manufacturers. So why are we, of all the things that we're doing, sending a message to the actual competitors of creating jobs in today's economy, why are we sending them such a message of uncertainty in this situation? These are real jobs in a marketplace that is growing. The middle class is going to grow from about 2.3 billion to about 5 billion people outside the United States over the next 15 years. We are going to see a doubling of the middle class. That is where products are going to be sold, in emerging markets. So those emerging markets don't all have the financial tools to make those deals a reality, but the Export-Import Bank can help. They can help make sure that a customer pays, that U.S. manufacturing wins, and that we keep our marketplace. So 
we hope that all our colleagues will support this legislation. Time is running out. Know that this program has returned over $1 uh, billion to the U.S. Treasury. That's a pretty good deal for us. If somebody on the other side has a better way of growing jobs and paying down the federal deficit, I'd like to hear it because this is an important tool and time is running out. I urge my colleagues to help support the Export-Import Bank. I thank the uh, President. I yield the floor.